Hey, welcome back on Political Spectrum. Just before the break, I had told you that I'll be joined on the show by our guest for today, the person of Barista Ndifreke Inyang. He's a legal practitioner, of course, a social commentator and political analyst. Barista, you're welcome on the show. Thank you very much. Good morning, Nigerians, and good morning, Akwaibu Man. Thank you for having me. Well, let, let's start the conversation by looking at some of the realities in River State. I mean, we are told that this is the sixth time uh, the House of Assembly in River State will be vetoing uh, the authority of the governor, Simon Alayo Fabara. We have seen, indeed, that in the past months, uh, there's been all manner of rifts uh, in River State, uh, leadership occasioned by the fallout uh, between the ex-governor, the person of uh, uh, Wike, uh, Yesen Wike, who is now the FCT minister, and his successor, the person of Simon Alaya Fubara. But then, we're just receiving news that the River State House of Assembly has vetoed the authority of the governor in making some decisions as regards the local government administration in the state. What do you make of this recent development? Okay, so I, I, I want to say that this is actually very good for the development of democracy in Nigeria. And then not just in Nigeria, for the development of democracy in um, river states. Mm -hmm. Now, the aim of every law is for the benefit of the populace, the citizens. So in the situation that the House of Assembly has made the law, and then the governor has refused to assent to it in accordance with the Constitution, so, so the, the, the law empowers the, the House of Assembly to go ahead and veto the governor or even the president and then, you know, pass that same law and then the law becomes, you know, uh, 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 a law in the state and mm. then it is being operational in the state for the benefit of the people of the state. Mm. Now, in the instant case, I don't want us to look at this vetoing of uh, the, uh, uh, the governor from the angle of the political squabble that is ongoing in River State between the governor the sitting governor and the immediate past governor of River State, mm. that is uh, the minister of FCT, that is my governor. Mm. So I don't want us to link it. To, I want us to look at it from the angle of the fact that does this in any way benefit the people? Mm. If it does benefit the people, then the, the, what the House of Assembly has done is right. Then secondly, is it in accordance with the law? The law provides in section 100 of the 1999 constitution has altered you know that where the house of assembly you know had passed a law and sent to the governor that the governor has within 30 days hmm. 30 clear days you know to either assent to the bill or to you know uh, 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 refuse his assent now where he assent or refuses his assent he's supposed to communicate you know to the house of assembly you know, in telling them that this is the reason for refusing his assent or he has given assent to the to the bill. Now, I understand that the bill was sent to the governor uh, to the governor on the 14th. It was passed in the house on the 13th, and then it was sent to the governor on the 14th of mm. March. And today is 22nd, is it 22nd or 23rd of March? 23rd. 23rd of March. And and this is 30 days has elapsed, mm. and so. Having, you know, 30 days having elapsed, the, the House of Assembly has the power, the constitutional power, you know, to go ahead and then veto the governor and then pass the law and the law, the bill, and the bill has become a law in reverse state. Now, the reason for this provision in the Constitution is for checks and balances. Now, imagine a situation that it is only the governor that has sent to, bill, to, to bills. Now, if, and the governor refuses to assent, what will happen? The, the House of Assembly you know, must have wasted their you know, legislative time to work on the bill and then pass it and then nothing happens. And then there are so many people that are going to be affected by this very you know, law that will be enacted. Mm. And those people will not you know, take benefits of, of the, the very law. So, so this provision in the Constitution is very, very important you know, in, so that there will be checks and balances. The governor cannot just do anyhow, thinking that he's the alter ego, he can do whatever he wants. No. Now, with this kind of, you know, thing, the governor will sit up. Mm. That when next any bill is sent to 
him, he's either he's going to ascend to it or he's going to, you know, uh, 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 not is uh, he will not ascend to it. So I, I I think this is a very good development, and and I want is I don't just want it to be in river state alone. It should be in other states, even in the even in the federal. Hmm. And again, I want to even see it in other states. Let this happen because th there's this notion that the governor or the president has a lot of powers. You know, and these powers are so enormous. That that's the belief we have that the president, the governors, that all they are the alter ego. They, if they don't say, if they don't sign or approve anything, nothing happens. So this 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 has come to deepen our democracy, our constitutional democracy. So I think it's a very good development. Okay, I would like to take this from another angle. Would you say that the reactions or developments in River State uh, is commendable, indeed commendable, when it comes to the issue of harmony of the different tiers of government. We have the executive, the legislature, and uh, the judiciary. And we are seeing these squabbles rearing up its head. Is there really a, a way we can alienate the realities in River State from the uh, political crisis that is ongoing in that state? We know Nigeria to be very big in uh, harmonious coexistence between these three arms of government. And now we are seeing these. Would, would, do you think this scenario would have played out if there was still a cordial relationship between the former River State Governor Yes and Wike and the current Governor of the state? Okay, so uh, uh, definitely, like I said earlier, that everybody will want to tie what has happened, you know, to the to the uh, issues in River State between the present Governor and then the the former mm. Governor. But yes, we know that the, the, in many other states and even at the federal, there is a harmonious relationship, you know, between the executive, the legislature, and then the judiciary. But sometimes, for you to have peace, there must be war. So first of all, we fight the war. By the time we fight, and then we discover that uh, uh, we are toe to toe, mm. then we'll, at that time we we'll now begin to say, okay, we are tired of this war. Let's begin to look for peace, mm. and then we we'll begin to put the modalities, you know, for peace. So at the moment, yes, it, it, it's, not, it's not very healthy because there's no harmonious working relationship between the, the House of Assembly and then the, the governor of uh, uh, Rivers, they representing the executive arm of the government. There's no harmonious relationship. But I, I, I think it's also good because, you know, when, when there's so much harmony, you've seen, you've seen in recent past where the National Assembly, you know, just approved you know, ways and means above the, 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 the threshold as mm. stipulated by the law, you know, to the former president. And look at the mess that we are in. Assuming that the National Assembly was not in a very cordial or harmonious relationship in courts, that kind of approval wouldn't have been made. Mm. And look at where we are in today. So sometimes we need this disagreement. Yes, it's good for, for, for healthy competition and balance. So mm. we need this disagreement. If I, if, if I have a friend, that keeps agreeing to everything I, I say, I will know that, that my friend is my enemy, it's not my friend. Mm. Because you must not agree to everything. You should be able to contribute, you should be able to disagree with me. Mm. As we disagree, at that time we begin to, you know, uh, del delve into the meat of the issue, and then the, the, you know, we'll begin, we'll, we'll, the, the better idea at that time will prevail. Mm. So what I'm looking at is, I think, I think it's just a team problem. In, in two, three years' time, all these issues will be resolved. And then you begin to see a harmonious relationship between, you know, all the arms of government in the past. Okay, so far, we've not, we've not got any reaction from the sitting governor, Simon Alaya Fubara. Of course, we expect some reactions from him in the coming days. But uh, what would you say should be the consciousness of uh, the leadership in River State, in the government? What should they be doing differently now? to see to it that these crises that we know are in existence in the state are addressed. Because as long as we are having to deal with these issues in that state, there will still be problem. At the end of the day, it will go back to affecting the people who are meant to, you know, be feeding off the uh, democratic dispensation of this particular administration if they are not able to do or discharge their duties effectively because of these different political squabbles when they should be exerting their energies into discharging the promises they made to the people then we're going to still be lagging behind in that state 
what would what should be the consciousness of the current governor, Simonalaya Fubara, in ensuring that as the chief executive officer of the state, he steps up to the task of addressing these security uh, these these issues uh, in the state to bring about uh, peace that is much needed for the growth of that state. Okay, so um, just like you've said, I think political leaders should come to the understanding that they are voted into that place you know, to represent the people. And so what should come first is the interest of the people and not their own personal interest and not, not their ego. Because I, I discover that sometimes m most of our leaders, you know, they mix up their ego, their personal interest, you know, as against the interest of the public, the populace that voted them into office. At the end of the day, whatever happens in River State, you know, will be attributed to the, the uh, uh, same Fubara, you know, administration. Mm -hmm. So he should understand that he has four years to perform. If he does very well, he will not be voted for a second term. So whatever happens at the moment, what he should be particularly interested in is the success, the legacy he will be leaving behind. And one of the, the best legacies he can leave behind in River State is peace. If there is no peace in River State, there can be no development. If there is no peace in River State, you know, the people, the lives of the people will not, you know, uh, uh, move forward. So going forward, I want to see, you know, the governor, you know, he should wield a big stick leave whatever you know uh, uh, interest that he may be you know be, be pursuing you should leave that interest and then begin to pursue the interest of the people of river state and how would that be done first all the warring factions has you know come to a round table and then have some you know agreement even some compromises mm. yes i can work with somebody even when i don't like the person so, but provided that working with the person will help me achieve the goal that I want to achieve. Mm -hmm. I'll work with the person and then achieve what I want to achieve. So, he needs to keep, you know, put all of this behind and then work with the people, you know, that he has. These people are also elected, some are appointed by him and all of that. So, he should, by the time he works with the people genuinely, other persons that were on the other side will begin to join him. Mm -hmm. So, he should be the one that should preach peace and inclusion in the state, political inclusion. Everybody in River State, all the citizens of River State are first River citizens before political parties. Mm. They are first River citizens before you know politics and all of that. So they should un he should understand this and then focus on what matters, which is the development and the advancement of the people. And like I said earlier, his best legacy will be you know ensuring that there is peace in the state. Because when there is peace, there is going to be development. So call everybody, you know, talk, the, uh, settle these issues and all of that. Definitely, there must be disagreement. Yes, there must be disagreement. So, but how do you handle it? It's part of the human life. But how you handle disagreement, you know, matters a lot. This one will ag disagree, this one disagrees with you. But you need to be able to call all these people, you know, together. Again... Uh, 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 about six, you know, bills has been assented by the House of Assembly, you know, uh, uh, thereby vetoing the governor having refused his assent. I want to say that the governor should ensure because the implementation of the law, you know, rests on the executive arm of the government. Mm -hmm. So he should ensure that the laws are being implemented 100% whether or not he assented to them. So when, when, when this is done, the state will be able to move forward. You should not just say, okay, since uh, 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 the House Assembly had decided to veto me, I am not going to implement it, I'm not going to execute it. No, you should go ahead and implement it and execute it. This will also foster peace in the state and bring development and dividends of democracy to the people. All right, Barry, so let's move on to other pressing issues now. Uh, this time from the security wing, we saw the president giving that very big statement as regards the efforts uh, by the African countries uh, to come together in ensuring regional security, ensuring that it, it protects itself from arms smuggling, ensures that it makes sure that all the warring sectors of the continent are addressed in terms of insecurity issues uh, of course, Nigeria has its own fair share of insecurity issues uh, in, in the country. And the president was able to mirror this through 
uh, with the fact that as long as Nigeria, uh, as long as Nigeria is not secure, uh, there are all the pockets of insecurity issues that affects the country coming in from other parts of uh, of Africa. Now, what do you make of this uh, security summit that the president uh, hosted? Okay, so um, I, I want to say that um, the the security summit is very very important. Africa has to start doing things differently from what it used to be. You know, we need we need to we need to build a one Africa and not a disintegrated Africa. Mm. By the time we are for a century, we we'll discover that a lot of our problems will solve the mm. problem. By the time we begin to see, like even if I am a Nigerian, I should see myself as an African, and mm. then I should think as an African. You know, by trying to solve the problem of Africa. At that time, we'll be able to, you know, reduce most of our problems. And one of the major problems that we have at the moment is the problem of insecurity. And you know that insecurity drives development away. So Africa should begin to think in that direction. And I really want to commend President Inobola Metinubu for taking the initiative, you know, to call on a one Africa, you know, security outfit that will be able to, you know, secure the, 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 the territorial boundaries of Africa, as well as also, you know, ensuring that because we have, in, in recent time, there's a lot of transborder crimes, mm. like the crime of terrorism, banditry, and all of that is transborder. So we, we need a standby force. Mm. We need a standby force that will be able to address these issues. But by then we have a standby force coordinating counterterrorism, you know, activities in the entire of Africa, now we'll be able to share intelligence between other national security outfits. Mm. They'll be able to share intelligence, and then in sharing intelligence, we'll be able to combat, you know, counterterrorism, you know, combat terrorism effectively in Africa. By the time there is, there's a collective effort, and then there's a collective resolve, you know, to deal with the menace of terrorism in Africa, you know, Africa will become better off. Mm. So I really... I really commend the president for this. Now, I'm going, be, uh, going beyond this. I want to say that we sh it should not just be the normal, you know, speech we deliver at conferences, at summits, and all of that. It should be, you know, something that will be reduced to a workable mechanism that will be pursued by all the, you know, uh, 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 the units in oh. Africa, all the countries in Africa, you know, to ensure that this is done so as to secure Africa. And again, by the time we are able to deal, you know, by the time we are able to set up a formidable, you know, force, you know, to combat terrorism, we, we, we will reduce external influences that mm -hmm. has been a problem in Africa. Because we have, you know, we have France. Recently, you've been hearing the Francophone countries pushing France away because of, you know, the, the, the problems that France have caused them rather mm. than the solutions that France has brought, you know, on the table. And many other, you know, countries, every now and then you see African countries going cap in hand to go and beg, you know, other countries of the world, you know, for one aid or the other. Meanwhile, if we now look inward and then begin to build a strong African force, we will be able to develop Africa, we'll be able to advance the ideals of Africa, we'll be able to, you know, bring lasting peace to Africa, we'll be able to secure the borders of Africa, we'll be able to do more business within ourselves, we'll be able to develop Africa, you know, like every other place that most of us are looking up onto. Mm. Rome was not built in a day, so we have to start, you know, today. Okay, uh, well, uh, there were uh, a twin security dialogue yesterday in the country. And the other part, uh, which was uh, spearheaded by the Vice President, uh, Kashim Shatima, uh, dealt with the issue of state security. A lot of uh, persons who spoke uh, that security dialogue uh, were in support of state police, except the Nigeria Police Force. Ironically, the, uh, the IGP Kayode Bachakun is of the opinion that Nigeria is not mature enough uh, to be able to handle state policing. And of course, he reeled out some of the uh, reasons he feels that the country is not ready for state police, one of which is uh, the issue of abuse by state governors. Uh, the IGP is of the opinion that if state governors are given the power 
to be in charge of uh, state police, despite the gains that we envision uh, to achieve from it. Uh, it is going to lead to some level of abuse, and I'm sure he is not talking devoid of the, uh, the political scenario. You know, he's indeed talking about the fact that elections eventually would come and governors would want to implement uh, uh, the tool of the state police to see to it that they are able to uh, inject whoever they want in the system. Well, uh, that is the opinion of the, the IGP, Kayadeh Bachakun, but away from that, we saw also the former uh, president of Nigeria, uh, in the person of Goodluck Jonathan, the former head of state, Abdul Salami Abubakar, uh, speaking all in favor of state police, saying that the gains far outweigh uh, the downsides, uh, the, the issue of abuse that the uh, IGP was speaking about. But then, uh, this is an, a very open conversation. A lot of people would want to look at it from different angles. Uh, what would be your take on this issue of state police, especially when you mirror it through with all the myriads of security incidences that the country has been grappling with? It has been said that if state police is put in place, these agents would be able to have direct access to the different nooks and crannies of the state where they, they belong, where they operate from, and would be able to understand better the security architecture of each of their states, but the issue of abuse still stands out. How would you reconcile all of these issues surrounding state police? Okay, so uh, I, I want to say that I think at this moment we, we should not be just talking about state police. We should we should actually practicalize state policing because it is very clear that. The, fe the federal police cannot police the borders, you know, of this country. We, we have so insufficient manpower. The police is grossly underfunded, you know, the manpower is gross. And so there is, there is very clear, abundantly clear, that the police at the moment cannot, you know, police this country effectively. Mm. Now, for for the the IGP, Kaya De Beto to say, that uh, because of the abuses, you know, and all of that, you know, there is no need for us to bring in state police and all of that. The question I want to ask is this. So when will Nigeria become mature for state police? Mm. And how will Nigeria become mature for state police if we don't actually practice it? There's this long adage that says that practice makes perfect, mm. right? So if you don't practice it, how are you going to become perfect? You cannot just, it cannot, it cannot maybe let's say, okay, if you are saying in the next 20 years, Nigeria will be the right for state police. How would, uh, what makes us, what would make us to think that in 20 years will be right? Mm -hmm. So instead of us to wait for 20 years, why don't we start practicing it so that by then we, we start it, we will now see the ills, we will now see the issues, we will now see the problems mm -hmm. that it has, you know, uh, 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 generated. Uh, generated. And then we will now look at how to solve the problems. And of course, you should know that government is about solving problems. Problems will always come up. Even the federal police is not perfect. The police under Kayode Betukun is not 100%. There are a lot of challenges, you know, in the Nigerian police force. And the Nigerian police force is over 50 years. And those issues are still there. So are you saying that because of the problems at the national level, we should not have state police? Are you saying because of the, the, the issue of abuse that innocent life that Hitato would have been saved would should be lost? Are we saying that because of the issue of uh, you know state governors using the state uh, police during elections that after elections the police cannot help in you know securing the lives of citizens and properties of citizens? So th this issue, well, if, even at, as it is, as the police is presently constituted, governors uses it during you know elections. The federal police who, who are not under the control of the governor, mm. the governors in different states uses them in you know, order to perpetuate election fraud and we all know this so why are we saying that because of this we they cannot have have state police but what are, so, what are the angle let me quickly put in sorry uh, what are the angle of the issue of being able to fund the state police that was another issue that the uh, igp raised 
some states, he is questioning some states' capability to pay the state police when, when, when they are eventually incorporated in their different states. Okay, so that's fine. Now, let, let, let's, let's, let's look at it from this angle. At the moment, most states are funding the federal police. Even in Aquaibom State, I know that the Aquaibom State government is funding this, the federal police. A lot of people they believe provide, that Aquaibom has the money. Yes, Aquaibom has the money, yes. But some other states, you know, there is no state that cannot generate money. I think we should not look at the problem of money. We should look at the, 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 the problem of the refusal of states, you know, to make their state viable. You cannot, you cannot expect to reap from where you did not sow. So you have to first of all sow. And how do you do that? The state governor should begin to invest in their state. By that they invest in their state, they'll be able to reap, there will be money. Invest in the state, let the state be secure. It, uh, investors will come in to do business. So you said your consciousness should move away from oil money because I think the notion in Nigeria is that once a state is not an oil producing state, it means they cannot generate uh, revenue for themselves. Zamfara state, you know, if if the state government is doing the right thing, Zamfara State should be the richest state in Nigeria at the moment. Because Zamfara State has a lot of minerals that are being, you know, uh, uh, carted away under, under, the, under the guise of banditry. Hmm. There's a lot of things that, you know, we hear of banditry in Zamfara and all of that. But behind banditry, there are so many, you know, you know, billions of naira being carted away in Zamfara illegal State. Mining. The the issue of illegal mining. Illegal concept. mining in Zamfara and other states. Now these are monies that if the if if the, the state is properly policed, this money you know shouldn't have left Zamfara State, you know, without the people of Zamfara benefiting from it. The state government would have, you know, gotten tasks and through the tasks they would have been able to do one or two things in the state and improve the lives of the people. So we should not even look at the issue of oil. We should look at the issue of management, proper management, transformational leadership. Many, many, many countries of the world today that are doing better are not depending on oil. And oil, as we all know, is a baggage economy. A lot of countries are moving away from oil. So we cannot keep saying oil, 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 oil. When there's so much money in agriculture, when there's so much money in mining, when there's so much money in telecommunication, when there's so much money in transportation and other, you know, aspect of the economy. Now, the oil we have in the south, you know, fine. The, 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 there is oil in the south. But other places, that God, we thank God so much that God has blessed this country with abundant resources in different places. So if, if the south has oil, they not has the you know, vast arable land to cultivate and make money. Mm. And so they, they should look at it from that angle. And again, they should also look at it that the creation of state police, you know, will bring about employment. Mm. The creation of state police will bring about stability, will bring about security. So, and then, and then, you know, the funding, this funding, the state governors receive security votes. Mm. So what are they using the security vote for? Mm. The security vote, part of it, if not all, should go into funding of the state polices and all of that. So we should not, we should not look at it from that angle. Every state, you know, if you prioritize something, you will always budget for it. If you don't prioritize it, you will not budget for it. We've, we've, we've heard of cases, even the very recent one in, a, in a Kogis, they were in the, the, the former governor, you know, it allegedly stole the sum of 80, uh, over 80 it's billion. Amazing. And this, this is the state that was not able to pay, pay salaries mm. for years. They will not pay. And that 80 billion would have paid salaries. Mm. There are people that in that state, you know, for months were receiving 10% of their salary every month. Only 10%. You can imagine a family of five, how would they will feed with 10%? Mm. And how much is the salary of a public servant mm. in Kogi State? Mm. But one person stole that amount of money. And they will now come out to say that there's no money in Kogi, there's no money in this other state because they are not producing oil. Well, um, let's come down here in a quiet home state where we r report that aside from the general economic crisis, the Nigerians are currently facing residents of a quiet bomb, an oil producing state uh, in the country, are in worse condition following the recent fuel scarcity in the state. Well, fueling stations in New York, Metropolis, apart from the NMPC mega stations and Trans Sosa have been said to have shut down operations in compliance with the directives of the Independent Petroleum Marketers Association, IPMAN, for fear of being 
uh, fine 300,000 Naira. Well, a letter of fear at the black market is currently set to go for 1,500 Naira, uh, which has made minibus and tricycle drivers to charge uh, 200 Naira for a drop in a short distance that uh, hitherto was 400 Naira as of two days ago. Well, Ipman, in a statement signed by the chairman and uh, the chief secretary on Sunday, said the decision to suspend operations was taken after a stakeholders meeting. The union also blamed a series of infractions into their businesses caused by activities of Natural Oil and Gas Suppliers Association, no gas, uh, where members uh, uh, products were said to have been impounded on the road and extorted. Well, the statement directed members to closed stations and outlets. Uh, we understand that the governor reacted to this particular issue and directed that uh, the appropriate quarters wade into swift action to see to it that uh, sanity is restored. Already, internations are of the, uh, of the view that uh, these marketers were directed to uh, slash uh, the amount that uh, the product is being sold for to reflect what is happening in other states. Uh, a, a lot of uh, opinions are, uh, are, the, uh, are saying that uh, some states already are selling the products for as low as 400 naira. Why is it not so in a Kwaibom state? But then, what do you make of this artificial uh, scarcity in a Kwaibom and the resultant effect it's having on the economic realities in the state? People are having it difficult. Commuters cannot move from one place to the other anymore in the past uh, two days. What is really going on and what should be uh, uh, the commensurate uh, reactions to these issues? Okay, so I, I, I have maintained this um, notion that, that as much as our government has a lot you know, to do, but I think our major problem is not the government. Our problem is are the citizens. The citizens are the problem of this country because I don't understand how you know, you have products that are, you know, you are supposed to sell. Instead of you to sell the products, you start hoarding it mm. so that you sell at a higher profit, thereby impoverishing other people. Because immediately we talk about increment in fuel price, automatically every other thing increases mm. because you have to move your goods you know, from one place to the other to sell. Another thing, businesses need, you know, because there's no electricity, businesses need uh, fuel, you know, to be able to power oh, their yeah, gen, yeah, to be able to carry out their business. And, and of course, the operational cost, you know, will translate, you know, mm. to the, the consumer uh, cost and all of that. So, so the citizens are the major problem. Instead of the citizens, you know, to keep pointing at, at accusing fingers, you know, on the leadership, they should look inward and begin to do things differently. Mm. Because until we begin to do things differently in this country, we'll still be having these issues. Why should there be artificial scarcity of petroleum you know, product in acquiring states? Mm. There is no reason why that should happen. We should begin to... I, 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 I'm happy that, that the governor has already you know, stepped into this issue. And this is, this, is, you know, this is very, very commendable that the governor has stepped into this issue to ensure that this does not continue you know, uh, long, uh, longer than it should be. Because it should not happen. And then again, at the moment where we are clamoring for you know, fuel prices to come down, you know, we... The, the one of our women is going up as against other states. We have our neighboring states mm. who are selling, you know, uh, at uh, the approved pump price. But in our women states, you know, uh, uh, um, day before yesterday, I uh, the the transport the driver that carried me told me ah uh, he bought at nine fifty mm. this morning. The one that carried me said he bought at one thousand three hundred. Some say they buy at even as high as one thousand five hundred for just one liter. Now, it trickles down to every other thing. So this issue should be addressed. Because, uh, and then one of the permanent solution is, uh, uh, you know, having the capacity to refine this product, you know, domestically. Because by then we're able to refine this product domestically. We are going to have enough in the country. We are going to have enough in all the states. And then the price will definitely come down. And again, again, we should also look at the issue of monopoly in the system. Every the entire country is depending on Dangote to, you know, to push 
his uh, 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 refiner Refinery. petrol into the into the uh, uh, the economy. Now we should not do that. Mm -hmm. We should ensure that the particular particular refinery, you know, it's starts working. Mm -hmm. Should be up and doing the worry, the Cardona and and other private endeavors, the Water Smith, the Azika refinery, the Boa refinery, and all of that. All of that should come up on stream so that you know we'll be able to fight monopoly. Because if it is only Dangote that supply uh, supplies fuel into the to the entire country definitely he can decide to sell at any price that he wants to sell and there's nothing you can do because we are all depending on him mm. so the government should step into this issue and then ensure that uh, the the artificial scarcity in aquarium state is addressed and then on a permanent basis the issue of uh, you know refining and availability energy in energy stability you know should be prioritized by this present government both at the federal and also at the state level all right sir nifreke Inyan, many thanks for your opinions on the show this morning we really appreciate it thanks for being a part of the political spectrum thank you very much and if you're just joining us well that has been the size of the political spectrum we'll continue to keep you abreast of happenings within the polity and of course bring you up to speed with decisions of government as it relates to the citizens of the country my name is Xavier Robert, and you can continue the conversation on all our social media platforms, all of which you can find on our website, SpectrumTVLive.ng. Do have a great day. And next is Business 360 with Blythe Lucan. Do stay tuned.